Hello and welcome again to the Young Economist Network on this course on macroeconomic modeling for sustainable development. My name is Sylvain Boko, and uh, in this session, I will be handling the first module of this course, which of course will have three lessons. So this presentation will focus on the first lesson, lesson number one, which focuses on understanding the economy on some basic concepts. So let's see what the content is going to reveal for us. Thank you, come along. Let's first do a brief overview of the national income accounting system. And I'm sure in your work, in different positions that you may have occupied, that you have seen uh, and you have handled uh, the national accounting uh, some fashion or another. So what we are calling, and this is just a review, uh, what this is, is essentially what the United Nations uh, says the following, that the system of national accounts uh, consists uh, of uh, several accounts that are consistent, that are integrated, uh, that will have um, uh, components that are balance sheets, that uh, will have components that are tables, and all of that based on a set of internationally agreed upon cost definitions, classifications, and accounting rules. So this course is not about that. But one of the things that we gain from the income part of national accounting system uh, is the real GDP of the economy, as well as other measures. So for this purpose, for the purpose of this course, um, we are going to focus on those, on how to measure the uh, level of economic uh, development, the level, uh, the rate of economic growth, uh, the change in consumption, savings, investment, uh, and, and, and those uh, measures, macroeconomic measures, debt, uh, wealth, etc., that uh, the uh, the economy uh, has to deal with every year, and that economists have to measure uh, every year. And also, we will look at the key players, the key actors in the economic system, right? So. We're going to talk about the public sector, the private sector, uh, you know, so households, firms, the government, et cetera. So because of that uh, consideration of the economy, uh, it is important in this first look of an economic system in this module, I'm proposing to you that we should first look at the economy represented as a circular flow of income. And what we are, uh, 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 we are going to work towards that. We are going to work ourselves towards that. In other words, the components of uh, the circular flow of income uh, uh, you know, will then show right, major exchanges between, uh, between agents, economic agents, households, firms, government, uh, you know, the domestic markets, the external markets and how goods, services, and money are flowing through the markets and between the markets. But to get to that, it is important for us to uh, review, this is a review for most of you, to review uh, a nation's, what goes into the calculation, the measurement of a nation's gross domestic product, usually called the GDP which as you know, uh, represents the value of goods and services produced by the economy uh, on its soil during a given period of time. 
So this is what we call the GDP. And throughout the course, we will denote the GDP. And by the way, I would use GDP and I will use total output interchangeably, okay? And we will denote all of that by uh, Y. Usually we will use Y to denote uh, the GDP. And how do you measure the GDP? The GDP can be measured uh, using three methods, and we are not going to spend time on those methods, by the way. But you know, there's the so-called the expenditure approach to measuring uh, the GDP. And you, so that is sort of looking at uh, the value of goods and services from the demand side. There is the uh, the income approach, right, uh, where you measure GDP based on the uh, the, the, the uh, after tax income that goes to every uh, different uh, uh, input, you know, this is labor, capital, uh, rent, et cetera, that goes into the production process, plus uh, now the taxes that have been paid to government. Uh, when you put it all together, uh, it should uh, give you the same value uh, of the GDP as the expenditure approach. And then there's obviously the, the value added approach, which looks at, uh, you know, at each stage of the production process, you know, what is the uh, extra value that that stage has added uh, to the total value of the production process. So you're looking at GDP, uh, in all the products that are, that are produced in the economy, it is uh, uh, calculated the GDP from the supply side. So this is review, you, you, you know this. What we are going to do for our purpose is to focus on the expenditure approach, okay, in this module. Um, and and what the, the reason will be, will come out very, very quickly, but under the expenditure approach, uh, and, and remember when we say expenditure approach is essentially this, we take all the key agents, players in the economy, uh, households, that's the type of agent, economic agent, firms, that is the type of economic agent, government, that is a type of economic agent, and the external sector, the foreign sector. Okay, when we take all of those together and look at the spending, the level of spending that they have each engaged in. So for example, households will engage in consumption. Firms will engage in investment, demand. And government will engage in government purchases. Uh, and of course, when you add the foreign sector, the external sector, then you have two streams that are coming into the country and out of the country. So imports of goods and services would be when the country buys goods from abroad and pays for it. And export of goods and services would be when the country is selling goods to the uh, rest of the world and getting paid for it. So when I take the sum of all that spending over the households, the firms, the government, and, the, uh, and then the net activity going on, net export, right? Uh, uh, our exports minus imports. When I sum all of that together, I get the GDP through the expenditure approach. As I said, whether you use the expenditure approach or the income approach or the value added approach, this should give you the same value for the GDP during the same period of time for a particular nation. So remembering that, uh, as I said before, we are going to use why to denote the GDP, then if you understand the way that I explained the expenditure method, then the GDP is found as the last equation, uh, Y is equal to C for consumption, uh, plus I for investment, plus G for government purchases, 
and plus net export. C plus I plus G plus, plus net export, where net export is found as export minus import for the country. That is uh, the value uh, and the method of GDP calculation that we are going to use. So this is an example. It just happens to be uh, a, a, the US GDP in 2004. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fact that it is US and don't worry about the fact that it's 2004. This is uh, an example showing you how to calculate the GDP once you have a measure of the spending in each of the categories that we talked about, right? So in you should be able to do this for your countries, by the way, and you, I'm sure you have access uh, to data uh, either from your statistical bureau or from other sources such as IMF, World Bank, uh, the, the, uh, uh, even uh, uh, the WTO, any of those, those uh, sources of data that we are going to talk about throughout the course, where you can gain. But the best way is to look at your own National Statistics Bureau, your own uh, central bank. Uh, these are the national institutions that should be able to provide you with these measures. They should be able to. Uh, so, in 2004, for the United States, uh, the total consumption was estimated to be, uh, you know, these are in billions of dollars, right? So, 8,000 billion, so 8 trillion uh, of dollars, right? So, investment was estimated to be, uh, you know, almost 2 trillion. Government expenditure estimated to be uh, 2 trillion. Uh, and you know, so those are uh, your C plus I plus G. Now notice you have six hundred and nine billion dollars for net export that is negative. Okay, it is negative. What that means is that in this particular year, this country imported more goods and services from the rest of the world than it sold to the rest of the world. Again, the negative for net export means that the country has imported more goods and services, right, uh, from the rest of the world than it has sold to the rest of the world. So what this means is that the value of imports for this country in 2004 exceeded the value of exports by $609 billion in that particular time. And so when you put it all to, you sum it all together, you get the gross domestic product, Y, coming out to be 11,000 billion, meaning $11 trillion for this particular example, for this particular example. So these numbers, uh, you need to calculate them for your own country for uh, right more recent times, right? 2020, 2021, of course, uh, we are not finished yet with 2021, but you can even calculate GDP uh, uh, per quarter so that you know you can trace, you can track uh, what is happening to uh, the GDP. Now, again, this is a, uh, an example that you can apply to your own country uh, uh, and that you should do as an exercise. So when you look at the GDP that we just, we just saw that they're on the table, and you look at the components and the weight of the components for the United States, using the United States as an example, okay? In 2004, you see that consumption occupies two thirds, fully two thirds, right? 70% of 
uh, the GDP for uh, that period for that country. The next is government purchases at 90%. The, after that is investment at 16%. And you can see the negative net export, again, value of the import being greater than the value of export uh, being negative 5%. Uh, for this particular example. This, so this is again how, uh, in terms of review uh, of your own uh, knowledge, you could take the data from your own country and then calculate the components uh, in uh, this way. Another way you can use the GDP is in a comparative and uh, evolutive fashion, right? So you can look at the GDP, as you can see here, uh, for several countries you can compare and over time, right? So this is looking at uh, the evolution of GDP uh, per person. So when you divide the GDP per capita from 1960 to 2008, uh, you can look at where country initially began from in 1960. For example, you can see that when you look at India, just look at India, and then you look at Nigeria, for, inst for instance. In 1960, uh, the, uh, uh, the log of the GDP per capita for Nigeria was higher, right? Uh, uh, by a full uh, percentage point, right? Uh, than it was uh, for India. So Nigeria's uh, GDP per capita was higher, if you put it simply, than the Indian GDP per capita when we began this period in 1960. By the time we got to uh, about what, 19, uh, I'd say 85, 86, 87, uh, uh, you already have India surpassing uh, uh, GDP in terms of uh, Nigeria in terms of GDP. And, uh, and then of course it has gone up uh, and opening up a gap uh, uh, since then. So that's one way you can use uh, the GDP in a, in a, in a, a comparative fashion. Uh, you, you can do the same thing with, uh, again, what's happening uh, with, uh, uh, you can look at Botswana, uh, of course, a much, much smaller country than India, but you can look at per capita, Botswana in 1960 compared to India, and then again, was one that shot up in terms of GDP per capita uh, and uh, India, which is uh, a little flatter, but again, uh, these are different stories. But you look at South Korea uh, in terms of compar comparison to Nigeria, again, South Korea and Nigeria began around the same level of GDP per capita in 1960. And then you can quickly see how South Korea uh, has opened up a gap very quickly uh, as, the, as we move forward in time uh, between itself and, and the Nigerian case. So you can, is the comparison of the evolution of GDP uh, over countries, across countries uh, and over time. So having understood that, uh, now we are going to cut and look at uh, uh, the model of the economy as a circular flow of income and expenditure. As I have said from the beginning, uh, when you have uh, key economic agents, you have um, domestic markets, uh, you have external markets, and these are going to interact, right? The agents, what, what I might call the agents, once again, to remind you, uh, households, firms, uh, government, right? The rest of the world, they are going to interact uh, among each other. So we will first, first assume what is known as a closed economy. And so under this assumption, uh, for the moment, we are not going to have uh, government sector. We are not going to have public sector. For now, we will add those later. We are not going to have uh, 
the external sector, the rest of the world will not be part of uh, this representation. For now, we are not going to have uh, the financial markets for the moment. Okay, so we will focus the first representation on two types of agents, households and firms, and two types of markets. Okay, so the markets for uh, goods and services, okay? In that market, we will assume, uh, and uh, we know in, in the market for goods and services, the sellers are the firms and the buyers are the households, right? Markets for goods and services, the sellers are the firms and the buyers are the households. Now, take the market for factors of production. What do you see? Uh, in that case, it's the reverse. The households now become the sellers, right? What do we mean by factors of production? Well, it is your labor, uh, it is uh, your uh, capital, okay? Uh, it could even be uh, uh, you know, your own uh, uh, skills, right? So it, it doesn't have to be physical labor. Uh, it could be uh, right, intellectual capital, into a human capital, uh, all of that. Uh, that is factors of production. And so in that market of factors of production, households are the sellers, right? Uh, not the firms. So the household, uh, the provider of factors of production and firms pay for buying, using those factors of production, right? Your wage, for example, is a payment for your labor. Uh, your uh, rent, for example, is a payment for using your capital, okay? Uh, and and you can go up, you know, skills, labor, skill, labor, etc. Uh, technology, if you're selling, uh, so it is that uh, flow of factors and then payments, right, for those factors. Contrary to that, if you contrast that in the market for goods and services, what we call goods and services, uh, it can be fridge, it can be. Ah, it can be cable, it can be a lamp, whatever that is, uh, that are goods that are ready for uh, usage, right? That you go and buy and that are ready for your usage, that you use up, right? You go and buy your car, you drive, you go and buy a refrigerator, you put it in your kitchen, uh, et cetera. In that market, as I said before, the households are the buyers, but the firms are the sellers, okay? What we're going to do, and you can see the flow the arrows representing the flow of inputs and outputs. And then you have, so that's your physical flow. And then that's the orange uh, uh, arrow. And then you would see that the arrows representing the flow of money, right, would be your green arrow. So this, again, your households and your firms, those are now the agents, right? Households buy, consume uh, goods and services, as I was explaining but they own and sell the factors of production. Firms produce and sell goods and services and they hire and use factors of production as I have explained. Okay, now, so let's start the flow, the flows, right? So uh, firms, right, produce the goods and services, let's say, which they go to the market for goods and services and they sell them, okay, they sell them. Now, of course, who buys uh, those goods and services, as we have said, is the households. So in this context, there's no government, there's the rest of the world, just a closed economy. Households will buy the goods and services uh, from the market, but how do you produce the goods and services? Okay, so up here, we're seeing the flow of physical, uh, goods, right, uh, being uh, uh, transiting through, right, the markets for goods and services. But how do firms produce those goods and services? Well, first of all, uh, we have to understand that as the household, you own labor, 
you own land, you own capital, you own skilled labor, you own human uh, capital, all of those things that are used in uh, the production of goods and services that you provide to uh, the uh, market for part of the production, those are bought and used by the firm. So for them, to, for the firms to be able to produce, they have to be able to have access to factors of production, also known as inputs. Now, of course, uh, when firms uh, sell goods and services, when they sell the goods and services in the goods market, now you look at the green, right? The green flow, uh, they get what's known as revenue, right? The payments that you make uh, in the goods and services, they become revenue for the firm. Those revenues become the uh, means by which the firm is uh, able to pay wages, rent, and profit in the factors market. So if you are selling labor, you earn wages. If you are selling uh, uh, land, uh, you are earning rent. If you, are, uh, you have your capital that you're putting uh, into use, you earn profit, okay? And it is with uh, the uh, those wages, rent, and profit, that is what becomes the income for the household. So, so, and it is with that income that the household now is able to engage in spending. So you can see how the flow of goods and services uh, is compensated with the flow of uh, uh, monetary resources, right? And by the way, whether you are calculating the GDP from above, so the value of the goods and services, or from below, so the uh, total uh, sum of all the uh, wages, rent, and profit paid to uh, uh, households, those should come to the same value as we said. So that is a representation of the economy as a circular flow of income and expenditures. Now, what we do next is to say, well, but it's not just the households and the firms that are in the economy. And um, it's not just uh, the uh, market for goods and services and factors of production that constitute the economy. There are other uh, players and there are other markets. So what we have here is when you add uh, the other markets and the other players to uh, this particular representation. So you will have your overseas sector. Overseas sector engage in export and import. So the market is the overseas sector. The activity is uh, export and import. We import when we buy from uh, the uh, rest of the world and we pay for it. So we pay the rest of the world for the import that we are buying from them. We export to the rest of the world, which means they pay us. So the flow of money comes in to the country and goods go out to them, you know, you, of course you have to be able to produce goods that you can sell to the rest of the world. Okay? But that is the function uh, of adding the overseas sector. When you add the government uh, in the middle there, government, uh, you know, its function is to obviously regulate, it is also uh, to help the different uh, market uh, the the different players uh, to be able to sustain themselves. So government, for for example, provides uh, subsidies, uh, provides uh, transfers, etc. They provide roads, they provide infrastructure, etc. Well, to do all of that, they what do they do? They remove a certain portion of your income that we call tax. So taxes would flow away from the stream 
of incomes to go to the government. But in return, government is injecting money into the economy through its expenditures. It's building roads, it's building, uh, as I said, infrastructure, uh, it is providing police security, et cetera, et cetera. So then government will uh, inject some uh, money into the stream, but at the same time, it will remove uh, uh, some money from uh, uh, from the stream of income or leakage. When you add the financial markets, financial markets are extremely important for the functioning of a modern economy, as you know, right? Without banks, without uh, insurance companies, we, we can't do much today without financial intermediaries. Financial intermediaries will collect the savings when you go and open an account, uh, they collect your savings uh, uh, from households. Even if government were to have a surplus, that also goes into uh, financial markets, which they make it, uh, uh, they make it uh, available for loan to be taken by the firms and firms use those loans to make investment. That is an injection into the stream of income. So financial markets essentially, uh, uh, they're there, they are the heart of the whole flow of money, right? Which they take, uh, they take in from one side of the economy and then they, uh, 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 they have they, they serve as intermediary for how those resources that they have taken from uh, that side of the economy can become productive resources by injecting back into the economy, whether it is uh, by making loans, uh, sometimes to the government, sometimes to the firms, et cetera, so that the economy can function. So you can see that by adding the uh, market uh, overseas sector by adding the government and the financial sector, it is a more complete uh, look as, as of the economy in terms of the circular flow of uh, income and expenditure. So uh, now what we want to do, now that we have those basic notions of what GDP is, uh, what, how to calculate, measure the GDP, what the factors of productions are, um, and understanding how the economy flows, right? How uh, the different streams flow in the economy. Okay, uh, we are ready now to review. Okay, uh, a traditional. Uh, modernly approach, a neoclassic approach uh, in terms of just representing the economy for analytical purposes, right? So this is going to be the first model that we will review in this course. Uh, it is known as uh, the solo model, okay? As, I mean, it's, this has been around since, uh, I believe, the 1950s. 1950s, I believe, was when uh, 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 it was first published. Uh, it has uh, been uh, modified. It has been augmented, uh, updated, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I'm calling this version the traditional uh, version, so that you can have a basic view of uh, the economy as in a mathematical fashion that would allow you then to say, okay, once I sit down and I, I want to see the connection, the relationship, right, between uh, the various uh, uh, activities in the economy the various, uh, whether it is output, whether it is input, whether it is technology, okay, how do I represent it? So uh, Solo has essentially uh, introduced this uh, back in the 50s, this way of looking at the economy, right? So that the GDP is a function, GDP Y, 
all right, the quality of output is function of labor and capital. In fact, in the, in the very first version, very first version, um, a representation of the solo economy, the solo model, uh, essentially we had uh, GDP is uh, in a functional form as a function of labor and capital. Really over time, right, people have, <laughs> right, uh, economists have come to recognize obviously that uh, it's not just labor and capital that go into the production process, obviously you have human, uh, human capital, you have technology, you have, uh, you know, natural resources, et cetera. And so uh, a more complete uh, representation of, uh, of the production process would be then that the GDP or the output is a function of, right, all these uh, various inputs uh, and, uh, and obviously with capital. Sometimes you make capital endogenous in some of the models. Sometimes you make it as, uh, as exogenous, uh, as you can see here. The, in order to have this production function to, uh, to be able to use it for analytical purposes, uh, again, for some of you, for those of you who have seen this, uh, it, it is again review, but in order to be able to use it for, uh, you know, for analytical purposes, there are certain assumptions that we are going to make. And uh, those assumptions, uh, you know, we'll essentially, we, you know, we will think of the uh, production function in the neoclassical realm as uh, displaying the following uh, properties, right? Uh, that, you know, it is, uh, that it has constant returns to scale. So uh, for mathematicians, uh, what that means is that, uh, you know, the function uh, is homogeneous of degree one. Uh, that it, uh, it displays uh, positive marginal productivity to each input, right? So uh, essentially each input we will assume contributes positively to output. So you're, if you are, uh, you know, if you are, you are using more labor, uh, that uh, you get something from, from using one more person, you, you know, if you're using one more unit of capital, you get something in terms of output from that unit of capital. But we will assume uh, what's known as uh, decreasing marginal productivity to each uh, input so that the rate at which each input adds to output will diminish over time, okay? Uh, and so, uh, you have here a representation of a production function that exhibits constant return to scale. Essentially, what it means is that if you were to uh, multiply all inputs in the production process by the same X factor, that production will also uh, increase by that X factor, okay? So multiplying all the inputs by uh, some number, positive number uh, uh, X, uh, means that production will also increase by under analytical uh, uh, purposes. Let's set the our X uh, to be equal to uh, one over uh, labor, one over L. Okay, and let's include integrate that assumption. We set it to one uh, one divided by L. If we include it in the uh, our uh, production function, then of course, Y would be divided by L. Uh, you would have the function then, uh, of course, L divided by L is one. And then you will have K over L, H over L, N over L. This is known as per capita output, right? Is a function of output per worker. I mean, I'm sorry, of uh, capital per worker, human capital per worker, natural resources per worker it would make it easy for us uh, to uh, work in terms of analyzing the production function uh, later on. So the assumption of diminishing marginal productivity means that the second derivative of the 
in each of its arguments or each of, it, of the, the input uh, of the production function is less than zero. That's what diminished margin of productivity is. So now we are talking delta square uh, F by delta square uh, by delta K square or I take delta square F by delta L square for labor, or I take delta square F by delta H square, et cetera, that each one of those mathematical functions would be less than zero. So when I put the two assumptions together, it means what? It means that each time that I add one unit of each of the input, uh, that enter into the production function, uh, this, this one unit will add positively to the uh, output, the total output. So total output goes up each time that I add one unit of uh, it. However, there will come to a point where additional uh, uh, a, units of any input will add, yes, positively, but at a rate that is going to go down and down and down. So for example, if you, uh, suppose you have a, a, a workspace with one computer or two, two computers, let's say, uh, if you uh, have one, was working in that work, the negative inductives are being used and both people are being occupied. If you add a third person, that third person can be helpful uh, because, for example, if one of the people, one of the other two become, uh, let's say, uh, tired, then of course that third person could replace them and then so that output can continue to grow. But once you're starting without adding any more, capital, any more computers. Once you are now hiring the fourth, the fifth, the sixth person, then what's going to happen, you see, is that you are going to have people who will be idle because you still have only two computers and they will not be able to have the necessary tools to uh, accomplish uh, much in terms of output. In fact, there will be a point where they will be not adding nothing to output and they will come to a point where adding more people will actually cause output to go down. People will just become lazy. So, uh, so that is the point where we call diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, so we are um, uh, making those assumptions uh, in this representation of the production function. With all of that uh, in mind, let me now uh, take us through just sort of basic uh, traditional uh, equations of uh, the solo model, okay? Uh, as I have said from the beginning, the solo model is uh, the neoclassical aggregate production function uh, in the sense uh, of all the assumptions that we have talked about. Uh, let us assume, as it is here in equation one, uh, that the production uh, process uh, as a function of time uh, is uh, accomplished with uh, technology that is A, with uh, uh, capital that is K, and with labor that's L. So my arguments in this particular example uh, of the production function would be technology, capital, and, uh, and labor, okay? Uh, so output at any point in time will be determined by the combination of those in technology, capital, labor. Now, so let's assume that uh, our capital depreciates at a constant rate, uh, 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 constant rate delta here. So what happens? Uh, then the net change in capital, right? So 
this is, uh, uh, think of it as a process in motion, right? So the net change in capital will be determined by what? It will be determined by two uh, components. One is the saving, the total amount of saving that the economy is able to produce. So that savings will be the, uh, the rate of savings, so that will be small s, times the total out, right? So uh, when you have a, a certain output or a rate of saving is 10%, right? So that uh, what this means is that you at least put, you know, 10% times uh, a billion dollars uh, aside uh, every time, okay? Uh, which you will intend to invest. You will intend to invest. However, so uh, if your capital depreciates, uh, then of course, what's going to happen is that you are not going to be able to uh, add the totality of that 10% of the $1 billion to your capital accumulation because you have to replace the capital, the, the, the portion of the capital of your economy that has depreciated. That is why you have this minus uh, delta K there, right? And so it is the, 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 the rate of change, the change in capital is going to be the total amount of savings that you are able to accumulate minus the portion of that that you have uh, devoted to replacing the depreciated capital, okay? Now, we will assume, just as an assumption, that the other uh, arguments, the other inputs uh, are also growing, right? So they grow at a constant uh, exogenous rate. Labor, we will assume, is growing at a rate of small n over time. So you can see the representation presentation of it there. Uh, the technology is also assumed to be growing at a rate of small g over time. Again, you can see the representative mathematical representation of it as uh, A of T uh, uh, and, uh, and the growth rate growing at G. All right. When I consider those uh, different growth rates, so now you have three different inputs that you have to cater for before you can talk about adding to your capital, okay? One, if you put aside the 10% of $1 billion, you have to make sure that you cover the growth rate in labor plus the growth rate in your technology and plus the depreciation in your capital, right? So it is the amount left over after covering, right, for all three inputs, that is the amount that you, you can now call the accumulated capital. And we represented a small k, uh, small f, small uh, uh, in, 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 in the motion term here, right? So k dot is moving because we are, we, 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 we are represented, as we said before, as a per unit, per unit, capital per unit, capital per unit of labor, okay? It helps to think of the economy as what is going on per another relative, relative to another input in the economy. So think of the economy, uh, I have my capital and in order to understand how production takes place, I have to be able to combine them and therefore I can think of the motion, right, in the economy as motion of capital per unit of effective labor. 
that is the representation equation four. And so S times F of K, in other words, the rate of savings times the per unit production and output, that is the fraction of the income that is saved. So in my example, the 10% of $1 billion of production that is saved. And therefore, uh, you have to remove from that amount the coverage of the uh, uh, depreciation capital, the growth in uh, technology, the growth uh, in, uh, in labor, and so that you will invest right uh, what is left over. Now, so the important thing here is that when you have steady state, because it, again, this is, think of this as a, this is a movement, right? Uh, in in uh, over time, right? So when you have steady state, steady state means what? It means that the movement has stopped. Okay, think of rolling a ball. You know the physics involved in rolling a ball on the floor. You know the ball will roll as it is rolling. That's the equation k dot that is working in motion. And then they will come to a point where the ball will stop, will be at a state of rest. It is known as steady state. At that steady state, the rate of change is zero. The ball is not moving anymore. The forces, the two forces that constitute then, uh, right, that are we're pushing the ball into motion. Uh, those will essentially be equivalent to each other. So at a steady state, right, the, uh, the fraction of income that is saved is exactly equal to uh, what is necessary to cover uh, population growth, uh, the, uh, uh, the depreciation capital, et cetera. So you have steady state at that point. That's very interesting because we'll go from there to be able to graph the, uh, the solo model based on uh, this equation five here, okay? Based on this equation five at a steady state. So then we can graph the model, okay? Um, in terms of graphical representation, uh, the vertical axis shows the output per unit of labor or output per head or output per capita, all of those are equivalent in this particular discussion. The horizontal axis represent capital per unit of labor, capital per head, et cetera. So that is the horizontal axis, okay? The line that is uh, starts from zero and goes upward, straight line going upward, right? Uh, is the line representing, uh, if you go back here, right? It is the line representing that last term, N plus G plus D uh, times K, right? So it, this is moving uh, upward in a straight line, okay? Uh, in, in this case, we simplified it. Uh, we simplify the representation uh, to cover just the population increase and the uh, depreciation in capital. So you have this uh, straight line each time. Of course, if capital per head is zero, there would be no output. So uh, the line starts at zero, uh, and each time. Uh, you add uh, a, a unit, a growth of unit of capital per head, obviously output also uh, increases. So you, you have, for example, uh, when uh, the small k was k zero, you can go to point A, right? Uh, and you can find out uh, what, the, uh, what is necessary what is necessary to cover, right? Uh, the growth in, uh, in population and the grow and uh, the depreciation in capital. So if you trace, if you track it from K dot to the line, you have A, big A, 
and you go back to the vertical line, it tells you what is necessary, the amount of uh, 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 capital that is necessary to cover the growth rate in population and uh, the depreciation in capital. And then you can do that all along that straight line. Now, the curves, that's a different story. Obviously also starts at zero. Look, let's look at the, uh, the black production function, right? So the production function is represented by the black curve. You can see several of our assumptions being exhibited in this production function. And remember, we are representing the production function in per capita term. The production function you can see uh, from between zero and C, you can see that there is a sort of accelerated increase in output as you add more and more uh, units of capital per, uh, per head, right? So that is the positive uh, marginal uh, uh, productivity. However, at point C, on the production function, we seem to have reached an inflection point. And from point C, you will see that each time you add capital per head, uh, yes, there's a positive increase in output, but the rate of increase starts to go down. So there's an inflection point that is showing up there. And then eventually what's going to happen when you are, for example, beyond D, adding more capital will actually, might actually diminish, uh, might actually take away from your output. So the assumptions that we have made uh, have also been, uh, been exhibited see, on the black uh, uh, curve. Now the blue of total output. So it's the same uh, assumptions that are applying it's just that it is scaled down by the uh, rate of saving. So uh, as I said, if your production value is $1 billion, and so your S then be 10% uh, 0.10 of that. And so that is, uh, you can see that it doesn't change the curvature. It doesn't change the behavior of uh, the curve. It scales down. So that we have now saving function, uh, we being here as the blue. Let's start with uh, initial capital per head, uh, K not K zero. Uh, as I said. If you go, you, if you, you, so going from K naught vertically at A, you will find the necessary amount of capital that is going to be required in order to cover the depreciation uh, in capital and also the uh, growth rate uh, in, uh, in population. Uh, and that is K naught times uh, N plus T move up above that to point B. Point B occurs on the uh, savings curve, the blue curve. Uh, when you, you track that, uh, you will see that it gives you on the vertical axis, uh, the total amount of savings that is corresponding to the output level uh, uh, K naught. So you can see S times K, uh, or, or rather S times F of K naught gives you uh, S naught, which is the total savings corresponding to production uh, that is taking place times the savings rate. Now, if you go up vertically from there, you get to point C. Point C uh, occurs on the production function itself. And so point C. Uh, on the vertical axis gives you the total output, total output that is corresponding to uh, the 
capita per uh, labor or capita per head level at K naught. So uh, once again, let's uh, pick up that. You start with K naught. If you want, you can go in reverse. You start with K naught, go to C, you find the total output at uh, Y naught. Then uh, you come back to B. B, you find the savings, the total savings corresponding to that output. Okay, and then down to A. A tells you the required amount of capital in order to cover the growth rate in labor and the depreciation. So, but you see, at that point, at K not the uh, economy is still, our system is still in motion. There's still, uh, you know, a dynamic, motion ongoing. So you can see the blue uh, uh, arrow, right, going from left to right. When you get to K star, okay, so your K star uh, in our representation, K star is your uh, steady state level of capital per head. Why do I know that? Uh, if, you, if you go straight from K star, to point E, you can see that that is where the required level of uh, capital to cover uh, labor growth and depreciation is exactly equal to the uh, level of savings corresponding to the total output. So the amount, the fraction of savings uh, that is coming out of total output is exactly equal to the required level of capital to cover the growth rate in population plus depreciation. So that is steady state. And that steady state at the level of capital, when you go up to D, tells you what is the steady state level of output per capita. So this is the typical representation of the solo uh, model. Okay, the economy starts with a level of capital that is less than steady state. At that point, there's motion, more capital is being accumulated, uh, more and more output is taking place. The, uh, and, and as you are going towards the right, towards the steady state, what is happening is that, of course, the amount of growth in labor and plus the amount of uh, depreciation uh, are both uh, uh, exogenous and constant. So the line is straight, but the savings uh, curve uh, is exhibiting diminishing marginal return. So there is less and less amount of savings in order to cover those uh, required uh, level of replacement. Uh, and that is because production is going to come down less and less uh, rate of increase will get less and less as diminishing return sets in. And so you get to K star where the process, the system is, the economy is at a steady state. Uh, uh, and that is where the analysis uh, essentially tells you uh, the uh, amount of, uh, you know, optimum level of capital at steady state optimum level of output at steady state at the optimum level of savings at steady state. Now, what happens, remember we were holding fix uh, the growth rate in, uh, in population and we were holding fix uh, the uh, depreciation in capital. What happens then if we increase the rate of uh, growth in population increases, then what happens? So what would be the effect of population growth on uh, capital per head, on output per head, on uh, steady uh, growth rate, steady state uh, growth rate, okay? Now, so suppose that uh, we begin, uh, as, as before, right? So we'll begin at steady state level of capital K star one to the far right. 
uh, at that point, we are at steady state because with the savings, total savings is equal to exactly what is required to, uh, to cover uh, the, uh, the, the growth rate in, in, uh, in population and uh, depreciation capital. And the corresponding uh, output level will go up to the production function, uh, trace it to the right, or to the left, I mean, uh, Y1 star. Okay, so that is the, our starting point. Now, increase, let's increase the population rate to N prime, so that N prime is greater than, uh, than N. So, so the rate of population, uh, growth rate of the population has gone up. Well, what happens? Well, the immediate effect graphically uh, is that you have a rotation upward of the line, right? Uh, that shows the uh, required level of replacement capital, okay? That line rotates upward to the dotted line, all right? You replace, again, a, a growth rate in the uh, population rate when it goes up, the rate of growth goes up in the population, it causes, right, the line of essentially replacement capital, uh, the required replacement capital, that line uh, rotates upward. When it does, then what happens? You can see that at T star, okay, a new steady state level of capital per head establishes itself. And what is important here is that when the population growth rate goes up, if nothing else is done, okay, say there is parabis, then what happens is that your steady state level of capital per head goes down in this model, okay? The steady state level of capital per head goes down in response to the increase in the rate of growth of the population. You have more people to feed. So if nothing else happens, if you didn't get another source of uh, resources from elsewhere, then of course uh, you cannot possibly uh, produce as much as before. Uh, you know, let's say in this particular example, we are holding fixed technology. We are holding fixed, uh, you know, accumulated capital. Uh, so we are just increasing the growth rate of uh, of population. So with that rotation graphically, then you have a new um, equilibrium, steady state equilibrium that is establishing at uh, T T star. And then you, you track it up to the production function and to the left, you have uh, the level, optimum level of production output that is Y2 star. And if you compare Y2 star to Y1 star, then what you will see is that the economy produces less output when the growth rate of the population goes up and without any changes in uh, any other input, such as the uh, technology, such as uh, uh, you know more capital uh, coming from somewhere, uh, and, uh, and etc. So that just population increase, it doesn't uh, bode well for the economy in the long run. Something else has to happen in terms of policy to compensate. Right, so that you know you have to find a, a more uh, better way to produce. Uh, you have to uh, uh, increase the rate of investment in the economy, uh, etc. But something needs to happen in order to even maintain production level. Otherwise, it is very difficult uh, to do. So. And so that is in the solo model, right? Uh, what the effect of population growth rate will do to both your capital per head, it, it causes capital per head to go down. Makes sense mathematically uh, when L is going up, of course. And then uh, the output uh, per head uh, also goes down. And of course the growth rate, the steady uh, state growth rate uh, also. Now, you go to 
uh, the next example, the uh, let's say we uh, we increase uh, technology, the change in technology improves as a better model. Uh, here we are, we will assume that technology is uh, increasing or is improving uh, in an exogenous fashion. So here, so A is multiplicative in this particular example, right? So uh, in this case, now you know the routine. Let's start with uh, the uh, this first level of steady state capital. Okay, so we are going to call it K star uh, uh, K star zero. Okay, K star zero. You go up to the uh, first output level in order or, or rather the production function right the first production function okay so that's going to be uh y not okay and so that gives you the level of output at y zero at steady state now what happens here uh and of course you have your savings corresponding to when technology improves exogenously, it actually causes the production function, okay, to increase, to rotate upward. Technology, if you're holding everything else constant, ceteris paribus, the improvement in technology will cause the production function to rotate upward in other words, you go from Y naught to Y1, right? So uh, uh, the production function itself is not changing. It's the technology, right? The slope, if you want. And so you go, you go up, and once again, you can trace and track what happens to the capital per head, right? Uh, so at the, at the junction, Okay, of the the new level of production, the new production function, okay, and the uh, and the corresponding savings, right? So that also will go up, right? You can see the savings going up from uh, S Y zero to S Y one. So you have an establishment of a higher level of capital per head, that's K1 star. And K1 star, track it up to the second production uh, function, it gives you a higher level of output at Y1. So right there from K star zero to K star one, what we see is that an improvement, exogenous improvement in technology, everything else constant, uh, helps to improve production. It helps to improve, uh, to increase, to increase, right? Uh, the level of capital per head at steady state. It helps to increase your total savings as well. And so repeat the same experiment and increase uh, or it make the technology, find a way to, to have the technology improve again then the same thing happens again, right? So, uh, a, a, you know, a second improvement technology go from A1 to A2, uh, the production function again, right? Rotates upward once again, and then of course establishes a, a higher level of savings again, and therefore a higher level of uh, the capital per head. So the, 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 the the uh, more you improve technology, uh, the better, right, your production processes become and you become more efficient, you create, right, more savings and you create, by creating more savings, you increase capital per head, right? So uh, it, it has a, a huge policy implication right there. Uh, so whatever government can do, we invest in uh, technology improvement. What this is saying 
is that uh, the more uh, we invest uh, in terms of policy in improving technology, the more efficient, efficacious we become as to the production uh, of output in the economy, the more growth we get, uh, the more expansion we get in terms of economic growth, uh, the more uh, uh, you know, savings we, we, are, uh, we, can, we can derive from that and the more capital accumulation we could also derive from that. Now, so uh, that's sort of basic description, both mathematically and uh, graphically of the solo model. Uh, where I would like for us to end is to look at uh, some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses of the solo model. And again, this is a model that has been around for so long, uh, has uh, gone through all kinds of uh, modifications and the changes. And uh, uh, so what is presented here is, uh, you know, was the, the sort of the basic, just to remind everybody of uh, uh, the, the basic ideas and concepts uh, uh, that were put forth by, uh, by Robert Solo uh, at that time, and which had become essentially uh, uh, the underpinning of a lot of uh, growth models that have grown uh, uh, out, uh, out of uh, the economic profession uh, since that time. And so some of the strengths of the model uh, would include the, uh, the fact that it really provides a, a theory, okay, that determines how well a country can be in, in the long run, uh, how, how, how well to do it, how rich the country can become. Uh, you know, for example, we just saw the last example uh, to say that if, if the country is able to invest in uh, better and better technology, it, it helps uh, to, to become much more efficient in terms of production. It creates uh, wealth, obviously, because more savings means more investment and more uh, production and more wealth uh, for the population. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we discussed really the sort of the, the dynamics, the motion uh, a, a, and transition from one state, state to another steady state. And so, you can uh, again, if you look at the uh, growth rate in capital in uh, population, what it does is actually causes right the uh, the growth rate to go down because more people are being added with nothing else changing in the economy. Uh, but if it is capital uh, uh, that is being added uh, through technology improvement, that then helps in terms of production. And so you can see the transition either to a lower level of growth rate or a higher level of growth rate depending on what is happening, the dynamics of the economy. Some of the weaknesses of the solo model, however, because uh, obviously uh, it is not all uh, uh, strengths uh, that we see in the model. One is obvious, obviously, uh, there's a lot of focus in the traditional uh, basic model on capital, on investment, on capital. It, there's not a lot uh, said in that uh, uh, iteration of the model with respect to, for example, human capital, with respect to total factor productivity. We don't know where technology is coming from within the model. It's not explained in the model, right? So. Other models, endogenous growth models, for example, have grown since then to try to integrate and explain uh, you know, such factors such as uh, total factor productivity and technology uh, in, uh, in the model. The, the solo basic solo model does not explain um, the reason why uh, different countries may end up having different rates of investment, different productivity. In other words, uh, the model doesn't expand, right? To look at 
you know, those differences, is it culture, is it the environment, it, is it uh, the, uh, you know, just choices by the different populations in terms of what is important for them. Uh, there's nothing that it says, it said in the model that explains uh, from one country to the next why, for example, some countries, uh, they have a lot of savings while others do not. Uh, and why will there, will there be, uh, for example, if I take some uh, resource rich countries in Africa with respect to resource rich countries uh, in other parts of the world, uh, why might you see uh, you know, lower levels of productivity uh, in one uh, country versus another, even though both may have uh, uh, you know, the, same level of, uh, the same level of resources. So, so there's a lot of uh, unexplained uh, factors in uh, the model. And, and of course, uh, the thirdly, uh, how do we sustain long run growth? Okay. Uh, is is uh, not uh, well ex explained within within the model, okay? and so many many models have evolved since then and tackle uh, some of these questions and weaknesses uh, uh, weaknesses uh, that uh, we have uh, revealed here in terms of the basic solo model, and this is the end of uh, the lesson one of module 